So I'm supposed to be cutting and installing trim for Soap and Clay Kidlet number two's room right now, and I don't want to. So um, I decided that it was a good time to, you know, hop on here and say hi to you and, you know, stall, really, because I don't... I don't want to do the trim thing, which sucks, because it's like the last thing that needs to be done for her room. But, you know, I'm notoriously awful at actually completing projects. So, thank you for being part of my procrastination today, really. Obviously has nothing whatsoever to do with the poor and what we're talking about today. I'll tell you all about that in just a minute, but before I do, hello, I am Mrs. Soap and Clay. Let's make stuff. How's it going, Sudzers? Welcome back to the channel. You are at Soap and Clay, where we make all the soapy things, and you are here for day 43 of 365 days of soap. You too. And uh, yeah, we are doing the full process of making melt and pour soaps today, and why that's cool. Now, for those of you who might be new and seeing this video for the very first time, very first time you've ever seen my face, we do daily content around here, and every week we have three days where we are doing, you know, back to basics type things and uh, testing and debunking soap myths and recipe days, and the other four are dedicated to, you know, the things that we really want to mess around with, like themes and stuff. So, you know, welcome. Hit the subscribe button. Do the thing. Yes. Now on to melt and pour. Melt and pour is a type of soap making that is weirdly controversial in the soap making world because soap makers like to make everything controversial, which I don't understand. Like everything in the world is so polarizing, why would we also make soap that? It's weird. Anyway, cold process soap makers swear up and down that melt and pour soap makers are not real soap makers. To which I say nay, because no. No matter what you do with cold process, hot process, melt and pour, there's an artistry involved in all of it. And I have seen some ridiculous designs in melt and pour that I will never be able to achieve. So they definitely have their own artistry in their own right, for sure. Also, a lot of melt and pour soap makers make their own bases. And I've done a video year one. Yeah, and I think it's probably time to go ahead and do another one. So look for that in a couple days. We will do another melt and pour recipe. And, you know, it'll be awesome, like a melt and pour from scratch, making the base, for sure, yes. But today I'm going to actually just dive into the process of making, you know, melt and pour and cutting it up and the things that I've learned and the things that you should not do. Should you be brand new to the soap world and you want to dip your toe in with melt and pour first, there are weirdly some things you should not do with your melt and pour base that, you know, I didn't know about the first time I was messing around with it. So, you know, let's go to the video and we will chit chat more about melt and pour and I will try not to get too scoldy to all the cold process soap makers who think, you know, they're better than because reasons. So the full process of making melt and pour. Now, for those of you who are OG sudzers and have been around since the beginning of the channel, I think it was like day 15 when I started getting froggy with cold process soap makers in regards to melt and pour soap makers. Because that's a whole ass field of soaping, the melt and pour thing. Now, I think the biggest reason people make melt and pour over cold process is because they don't want to mess around with lye. And I get that. 
But also, there's an interesting artistry that comes along with Melton Poor. And Melton Poor has its place in the, the soaping world for, I don't know, people with like overly oily skin, right? Melton Poor is great for that. And I, whatever. My whole point with this, with Melton Poor, is that it is an actual soap thing. You can consider it handcrafted, and there is an artistry to it. And let's go check it out. But to that, speaking of uh, not messing around with lye, I actually was just on Brambleberry's website, and holy shit, Melton Poor prices have skyrocketed. And so I think in a couple days, I'm going to do a Melton Poor recipe from scratch. I've done one on the channel before. I'm gonna give a different one, a kind of easier one to do with less butters for people who want to dip their toe into actually making this melt and pour from scratch. Cause it's actually not that hard. It really isn't. But for this, you start out with all of your chunked out melt and pour soap, right? In about one inch cubes ish, just something that's going to melt reasonably easy in the microwave. And then you're going to melt it down. Um, everything about melt and pour I've ever seen says to do it in like 20 or 30 second bursts. I think that's bullshit. It, and it's annoying to check your, your, your microwave every 20 or 30 seconds. And so I usually do one minute bursts until it's mostly melted. And then I go down to like 20, 30 seconds. Biggest thing is you don't want it bubbling or burning. Now the cool thing about melt and pour is you use a whole lot less of your scent or your essential oils. You don't need nearly as much to scent your batch. And so for this particular recipe, it's 50 ounces in total of melt and pour just to fill one of those little pink silicone mold things. And it has a total of 25 mils of scent. And in this case, it's it's a Nag, a Nag Champa essential oil blend. So there's that. Now, a couple things to keep in mind if you've never messed around with Melt and Pour. Don't stir the soap in between microwave bursts because that actually does create a really thick, gelatinous, not fun thing. And so I know it goes against everything in your nature to not stir something after having it in the microwave. Don't do it. Just, just don't do it. Don't stir it, let it do its thing. And once it's fully melted, then stir it. Stir in your colors and your scents and all that jazz. Now for the color prep that I did with the brown, I just took a little bit of mica and I actually dispersed that in glycerin. Now it's not even necessary to disperse it into anything, but you can disperse it into rubbing alcohol you can disperse it into glycerin, uh, not water. Water will make the batch weird, not oil. I mean, I guess you kind of can with oil. You can add a little bit of oil to melt and pour, but you can also just do nothing, like disperse it into nothing and just continue working in these this, this mica until you don't have any more big concentrated flecks of mica, right? But since it's a glycerin base, I prefer to just disperse my micas into a little bit of extra glycerin. And that works reasonably well. You know, 99.9% .9 of the time. But I also want to show you what this ends up looking like if you add it to a cool-ish melted melt and pour base. Now, my melt and pour sits around 145-ish degrees when I pour it into my mold. I don't like doing melt and pour any hotter than that, but any cooler than that, it gets a little bit weird. Now you see that film on the top of this clear. So it's actually cooled down to, I would say around 120 degrees. It's developing that film. And so what happens when I add this cold glycerin or the warmish soap to the 
cold glycerin that has the colors in it is it starts to create kind of a congealy weird mess and that's kind of gross it's not going to distribute well into the batch it's very slimy not a lot of fun see that's not that's not cool but you can absolutely just take that back to the microwave pop it in for you know 30 ish seconds so that glycerin mica thing that you created can melt down again and disperse properly within the soap. Now, while that is melting down, I am working with the other color here. Now, you can do some very interesting artistry with this. Now, what I like doing with this particular um, soap, which is called What'd You Call Me in my line, it's a Nag Champa blend. Like, What'd You Call Me? A Nag? That. I like mixing the clear and the solid melt and pour bases to create some very interesting sort of like almost wavy watery textures in it and so this is kind of what i what, what i do now for this bottom layer it was 25 ounces of the solid base and for the top layer it's 15 ounces of the clear and 10 ounces of the white which i will then take and pour into the mold after stabbing the crap out of the bottom layer to allow the white and the blue portions to sort of mix with the brown that has the poppy seeds in it. Now, this is not a suspension melt and pour base. And so these poppy seeds are not going to be fully well suspended within all of this, but because I poured it reasonably cool, we will likely find poppy seeds on the top and the bottom as well as in the middle for this. You don't necessarily need a suspension soap base for melt and pour as long as you are incorporating the exfoliants or the things that you want to suspend at a cooler temperature. And so, you know, around 130 degrees. Now I stabbed this a whole lot to allow the blue and the white to go down into the brown. And then I'm just pouring a wall pour close to the surface of the soap to continue on with the pattern at the top. So it's not just essentially one big brown bar. I want the variations that you can get from the blue and the white within the brown throughout the entire thing to again kind of look like a wavy beachy effect. And this is not a soap that actually needs to set up overnight and you obviously don't want to put it into the oven for sea pop and gel because there's no need for that this is a cool thing about you know melt and pour it's ready within a few hours and you can you know package it and sell it right away so if you're running a multi-day market and you run out of soap it's a good idea to have melt and pour in your line so you can make some real quick overnight and get ready for day two okay now on to the cut and melt and pour, the biggest thing you have to worry about with melt and pour when you're making melt and pour is you want the layers to stick together. And I don't know how many times the soap apprentices have come to the shop and I give them, okay, it's time to do some melt and pour soaps. And it's what I think is a very easy recipe. And then they pour it and then we cut it and everything falls apart. All of the layers are just crumbling on themselves. Well, that's because they did not spritz the uh, the layer beneath before adding the next layer, so it's not adhering well, or because you spritzed it too much. There actually is, you can't be too heavy handed with, or you don't want to be too heavy handed. You absolutely can be too heavy handed with your alcohol, with melt and pour and sticking. But that's really the biggest problem that you're gonna run into with melt and pour. And again, I have seen melt and pour soapers with such gorgeous designs and I'm blown away when I look at their bars, but then I look at like the sort of texture of their bars and I'm like, this is not cold process. And they're like, no, it's, it's melt and pour. And I'm, I'm, I'm big shook. Like, how the hell did you manage this? This is, this is sorcery. There is definitely an artistry that is involved in melt and pour. And they also have the added benefit of, you know, not having to use the lye and the caustic and all the things. 
And so that's cool. And that's freaking also cool. Look at that thing. That's beautiful. That's super fun. And the the drop down of the blue and the white, that's, that's delightful. That's a cute little how to swirl melt and pours for sure. But yeah, no, I mean, melt and pour definitely has its place in the soap making world. And it always bothers me when cold process soap makers say that there is no place for them because that's not true. Especially if you're making your melt and pour bases from scratch because then you're using the you're, you're, you're still using your caustics, you're still using your lye, but you're also creating, you know, something that's actually pretty smart for your business and your production rate to ensure that you never go out of stock on anything. I mean, it's, it, it can be a win-win all around, but you know, regardless, Mountain Pour, it's cool, has its place, and that's basically the process on how you do it. That is a day 43, and we will be doing a Mountain Pour recipe in the next couple days. And there it is, the full process of making melt and pour soaps. And yeah, it's a pretty fun process for sure. There's a lot of different things that you can do with melt and pour. You can get cool swirls into them if you're playing with the temperatures at which you're pouring. So anywhere around 120 degrees if you want good swirls, that's a good place to start. You also, as, you, as I talked about, need to make sure not to stir your melt and pour between bursts in the microwave because it does create a really thick gelatinous mess that really never melts down. So let it do its thing until it's all basically melted down and then you can start stirring to let the remaining pieces, you know, do their melty melt thing for sure. Also, if you're doing layers and all that jazz, make sure that you spritz it with rubbing alcohol, but not too much. Uh, several soap apprentices over the years have learned that the hard way. Actually, existing soap apprentice Georgia May hates making melt and pour because she's had so many soaps that just separate between layers because she's putting too much uh, rubbing alcohol down actually. So another cool pro tip. Yes, if you are interested in becoming a sudzer, do that thing. Hit that subscribe button. It doesn't cost you anything, it's just a button. Do that, that would be awesome. Like the video too, that does something. That's good, yeah. And uh, if you're interested in any Melt and Pour soaps, I don't think I actually have any on the website at this point, but I have a lot of other stuff at soapandclay.com. So go, ch go check that out for sure. For my sudsers, thank you so much for joining me for another day of 365 days of soap. I am out of here for today. I've got to go put up some trim because it's time to stop stalling and just get that shit done. So I will uh, see you tomorrow for another round of Soapy Fun. Bye.